Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to the series premiere of DevSecOps is the Way. Uh, this is going to be an awesome show, the one that I will thoroughly enjoy producing and hosting uh, on a, I think, monthly basis. Dave, do you want to take it over and maybe explain the whole program, how you've got everything set up right now? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so DevSecOps is the way. It is. I'm used, to, I'm used to hearing that every Friday night in the fall. But uh, it, we're really excited to bring uh, security uh, to OpenShift TV every month, every monthly cadence. We've actually organized a bit of activities um, around a monthly cadence of security information from Red Hat and, and our ecosystem partners. Um, I'm a global solution architect focused on our security ISVs. So I get the uh, pleasure of working with a lot of great partners and understanding the security landscape and being able to um, build out a point of view with, with some of my colleagues at Red Hat around DevSecOps. So we decided to have this monthly uh, new series, DevSecOps is the way, um, to showcase a certain security topic every month. Um, so let, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and then we'll talk about this month's um, security topic, and then we'll introduce our esteemed guests here who, who are next to me. But let me just share my screen here and um, show you all what we're planning. So you can see here we have a monthly cadence starting this month in March all the way till December. Um, with different topics. And oh, by the way, those different topics are specific categories that we have worked with the industry and with our partners to um, form a taxonomy around DevSecOps and the security methods and functions um, that you would need to think about when you're uh, implementing DevSecOps. So every month you can see that topic. If you want more information, uh, you can see on the left-hand side there there's a URL, a shortened Red Hat URL, red.ht, um, DevSecOps. And by the way, the D and the S and the O do need to be capitalized. Don't ask me why. But uh, if they're not capitalized, you'll get a 404. Or you can email us, and that doesn't need to be capitalized, at DevSecOpsHelp at redhat.com. Um, so this month is Vulnerability Month. And... Um, we although vulnerability is not a specific category that we defined in our taxonomy, it does belong in what we call application analysis, which we'll be talking about in a handful of months upcoming. But vulnerability analysis and scanning has been such a big topic over the last couple of years, especially around container scanning uh, with our partners, with our customers. And so we wanted to dedicate the entire first month to vulnerability, vulnerability scanning. And it um, sort of ducktails nicely into a certification program that we'll talk about a little bit later in this program called the Red Hat Vulnerability Scanner Certification, which we just launched late in February. So at a high level, I should say we're gonna we're also gonna be appearing in another OpenShift TV uh, show that we hijacked. <laughs> That's usually gonna be in the third week as well. This this month it's in the fifth week of March. We also have a set of three podcasts that we're planning to um, push out uh, every month, and then blogs and white papers along to go with it. So a lot of good stuff in 2021 around DevSecOps and security with Red Hat. Nice. Yeah, so I guess with that, I'll, I'll let our uh, guests here introduce themselves. Um, Jeremy here is from our product security team. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Jeremy? Sure. I work with our product security team here at Red Hat. I'm a part of our product security incident response team specifically. Uh, my team uh, works primarily with our container portfolio, uh, hence why I got pulled in to talk in this particular segment. Yeah, glad to, glad to have you. And of course, one of the main things we're doing is bringing in experts to talk about these categories on a monthly basis. Jeremy's one of the, those experts, as well as Steve here on the IBM side. So Steve, please introduce yourself. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Steve Osepic. I am the uh, CTO for IBM's X-Force Red team. And our, uh, 
our job. We're the offensive security team within within IBM, and uh, we work with our clients to figure out how attackers get in. So have a lot of uh, good perspective from the field in terms of these uh, container vulnerabilities we'll be talking about. Awesome. Well, I guess, uh, Chris, if you didn't have anything else, I'll, I'll hand no. it over to yeah, Jeremy to start. What we wanted to do was just give you all an introduction into how Red Hat handles security. Um, and, and I'll let Jeremy do that. And then we'll talk about our new certification program. And Steve will provide a lot of great insights around real world you know, customer um, situations around, around vulnerability scanning and his security practices. Great. Thanks, Dave. Well, I, I guess the first place to start is talking a little bit about how Red Hat handles vulnerabilities, how we, uh, how we analyze them and what we do with them. So uh, can you see the screen I'm sharing, Dave? Yeah, okay. yeah. So this is a, a nice little graphic we just recently put together to better describe how we do vulnerability assessment internally here at Red Hat. Um, we have a process, a fairly complex process of identifying vulnerabilities out in the market. Uh, we watch uh, mailing lists, upstream channels, uh, various feeds. We pull that in. We uh, create tasks to take a look at those. Uh, we do some initial triage on those on those initial tasks to determine, you know, if the, if the vulnerability actually aligns to our portfolio based on our manifests, right, uh, for products that we ship or build. Uh, our analysts then do some some verification along with engineering, and we kind of move into this triage and coordination phase. I'm going to pause here for a second and, and highlight like one of the differences between how Red Hat operates and how maybe some other companies operate. Product security for us is a kind of a hybrid process. It's not a, we, we're not a, a standalone product security team here at Red Hat that do, does everything from start to finish. It's a company-wide uh, effort with, within our research and, and development department, right? So uh, when we're doing this triage, we, we work very closely with the engineering team. Um, who work very closely with upstream as well. Um, so this is part of what you see here in that red section on that coordination. We, we want to validate and ver verify what we're seeing with our engineering peers. Um, after that verification is done, we, uh, we work to remediate these uh, um, vulnerabilities. So this includes filing bugs and trackers for, uh, for every product that is potentially affected. Um, so I, we have a huge portfolio and, and uh, it's uh, uh, important for us to, uh, to track you know, these vulnerabilities across the entire portfolio and not just look at just a single product. So when we get a request that comes in that says, hey, we think this particular component is affected or this particular product is affected, you have to drill back down to the, to the low level component and figure out which products consume that particular component and, and which version of that component was, it was shipped with that. Um, I, I think a big uh, selling point behind the, the, the methodology, the way that Red Hat does analysis is um, because we build our products, and this is a key point, right? Because we build our products a certain way, and we configure them a certain way, and we ship them a certain way, uh, it's not always black and white from a, from a vulnerability standpoint to say, yeah, you're definitely affected, you know, the same way that a researcher may have discovered it, right? And the way that it was reported up through our national vulnerability database. Um, our, we may actually compile out so the, 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 cut, the questionable code. And if that's the case, then you know, that, that particular product isn't, isn't uh, affected by that vulnerability because the code isn't present. So it's very important for us to staff analysts and, and work with engineering so that we can actually do that type of analysis. Um, we feel like that's, that's a more accurate uh, process and that it's helping our customers better determine their risk um, and, and whether they're affected. Um, the last thing that you'll see here in the green section, we do, we do a lot from a recovery standpoint and communicating this, out, this back out. We've recently launched security bulletins um, to improve the level of communication regarding major, major incidents. Um, we, uh, we have a lot of um, tracking you know, to make sure that uh, we, uh, any of these trackers, any of these products that are affected, that it gets all rolled up into, under our CVE pages. I think a lot of people out there are probably familiar with the, the Red Hat CVE pages. It's, uh, a, a lot of companies similar to Red Hat do the same thing. And we, we roll that data up into that CVE page based on um, all of this tracking and communication efforts. So that's really how we do the vulnerability analysis um, and how we, how we handle these incidents. 
Um, Dave, any questions before I go on to something else? Uh, I do have a question. So um, how much of this do you think is done by the, <laughs> and I don't want to sound like I'm being mean to, to them, but the National Vulnerability Database, right? Uh, because I know that NVD and CDSS are sometimes seen as a standard, but from my, from my understanding, they just don't have the resources to test vulnerabilities and they don't have the products, obviously, that we own to know if they're really affected or not. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, actually, a couple of things on that. You, you mentioned quite a bit there, so I'm gonna unpack all of that. First of all, uh, NVD, NVD don't actually do the vulnerability assessment themselves, right? They're, they're a storage uh, database, a communications, a coordination kind of company, or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, so it's actually independent researchers, companies like Red Hat um, across the world that, that submit their information up to NVD. And the problem with this is that you, you take a piece of code like OpenSSL, for instance, and it's used by almost every software vendor out there. But there are different ways to exploit that code based off of how that software vendor is shipping the code or configured the code, right? Um, so the problem, the fundamental problem with a single score, a single uh, rating out there in NVD is that um, it, it, it's, it's not inclusive of, of those many temporal characteristics, right? Um, so I think that's where we, where we run into some challenges sometimes. We try to be much more accurate here at Red Hat with doing our analysis. And you know, we may rate something as like a moderate issue because we've not compiled in that bit of, that bit of code. Whereas if you go look at the NVD score, it may be rated much higher. And you know, from the flaw perspective itself, that might be true, but you always have to take in those character, you know, those temporal characteristics as well. Um, the other thing that you said in your statement, and then I promise I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, you mentioned standards, right? So uh, this, is a, this is a very important thing for us. Um, I probably same thing for, it's true for Steve at, at, at IBM, right? We leverage OVAL, CVSS, uh, CWE, CPE. Uh, these are all done by MITRE, first.org. We work heavily with NIST on their NIST 800-160 uh, um, uh, um, policies, right? policies and standards, um, OWASP. Um, these are all like industry-wide kind of standards that um, we, we adhere to and, and we have made part of, our, part of our process in the terms of how we do analysis and how we disclose back to customers. No, absolutely. I mean, you bring up a really good point about how do you figure out the attack surface, the actual, um, you know, the way that the packages, I think, to what you were talking about are by default configured, is that even really attack surface that is going to be focused on, you know, by the attacker or what have you. So a hundred percent, I think, you know, on the, on the attack side, what we're always trying to do um, and what we, what we use intelligence that we gather to do in, in X-Force Red is we also look at how much um, in the same lines of what you're talking about with CWE and these others, CAPEC, you know, another MITRE standard and, and MITRE attack. And we're trying to, you know, we we're, we have intel, intelligence that shows us how much uh, attackers are weaponizing those exploits and 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 of those exploits is. So to, exactly to your point, when you have a whole bunch of things that are that are critical or coming out the same score in CVSS, what do you focus on? Focusing on the things that have the most attack surface, right? It's just all of us are trying to get to that same place of measure. Yeah, I can imagine, Steve. You you've probably heard more than once a, a customer say, I've got all these critical vulnerabilities, you know, and then you have to be like, well, we got to, we got to do a little bit of, you know, triage or manual right. to really find out if you're affected. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that's what we've really built a lot of our services around is, is helping clients to do that. And what we always advise, regardless of if we're working with them in this capacity is, is to be, is to take into account that context um, that Jeremy was talking about. There's what they call the temporal factors that feed into CVSS, but also just are these vulnerabilities really being targeted? Are you hearing about them? Are they kind of like these more wildfire based uh, uh, attacks? tempering that with the ones that you know are have been bad from years past um there's one that's really common you've heard of you know the shadow brokers ms17010 
clients still have that. That's that's from several years ago. It is absolutely the thing that'll get targeted by attackers if it's there. And so ensuring that you're not just always chasing the, the, the newest shiny one, but focusing on vulnerabilities that you that we know are being heavily targeted by attackers in the past and really, you know, honing in on those. Cool. Dude, and, can I can I say one other thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the on the uh, severity ratings themselves, um, and I'm curious to kind of get Steve's thought on this as well. One of the things we've noticed um, was that the industry seems to have kind of over the years kind of incorrectly started using those those severity ratings to kind of gauge risk, right? When really, like our position on it is that right. it's, it's supposed to prescribe some kind of order for remediation, right? Absolutely, like prioritization. It's it's a great point, and CVSS honestly is a good metric if it's used right it's a it's it, it is it is lingua frank franco of 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 our space however to your point it's being used to measure risk when really as a, had a number of cves that i've written myself and vulnerabilities i've discovered and when you you go out and you use that cvss calculator Everything that you're doing when you create that CVSS score is the worst case scenario. You're not measuring how much time it takes to make a uh, uh, to make an exploit. And frankly, <laughs> you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot as a as a researcher with the, the calculator because when it gets to that point, it says attack complexity. It's very easy to sort of pop your cop and say, oh, it was very, very complex. It was very, very hard for me to break into this. You know, no mortal could just do this. Like I'm, I'm the one, I'm the only person that can do this. So you're going to set the attack complexity really high, which is going to bring that value down. But think about this. If I create a Metasploit module for that, if I go to exploit DB and I show how to do it, attack complexity goes out the window, right? You're not talking about that anymore. I've just given you the ability to do it by running a script. That's the piece that is one of the biggest troubles we have is if you're just using CVSS, imagine you're taking CVSS 10s that were privately reported that don't have any public exploit code and saying that those are more important than something like MS-1701, which is, you know, it has, has a very high complexity of attack, not that hard if you're downloading the, the scripts to, to, to break in, right, which of course all attackers are doing. And I would say I'm glad you mentioned the calculator. I was going to mention that as well. It's it's right there on the on the NVD site, so they know um, that their scoring is not really, you know, is not potentially risk for you. It's it's a guideline, right? It's a it's a recommendation to prioritize, and then mm -hmm. you know add in your own environmental and temporal metrics to to figure out if you're really um, exposed. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think it was created originally to take from the researcher and give to the vendor. I think that's what its primary purpose is. And then as you know, there's that little bit of negotiation that happens in terms of how, how high is this really, you know, how high of a score is it? And of course the researcher is always gonna think it's a 10 and the vendor is always gonna think it's a three. <laughs> that's yeah. somewhere, somewhere in the middle, you figure, right. figure it out, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so Jeremy, a lot of times, um, you know, Red Hat has a different score and they have different severity categories. Can you just talk a little bit about that in terms of how we how we score and um, categorize these CVs? Well, I, I think, you know, first thing I'd say there is uh, we don't have a different scoring system, so to speak, right? We, yeah. we use the same low, moderate, high, critical that, that the industry uses. Um, but we do score things based on the temporal characteristics we talked about just, just previously. We do score things differently than what a researcher might have scored it. Um, now, some of the things that we, we recognize that, you know, you're a customer, you're looking at this information, it gets very confusing, right? So um, if you look at our CVE pages, we've, we're, we're trying to, to help um, uh, uh, kind of pull the, the curtain off of that, that mystery, so to speak, right? So we do a comparison of the NVD score versus the Red Hat score. Um, our team works very closely, whatever we feel like, you know, if we've, if we've re if we've scored something differently, and I'm talking about scores for a second, not the, the rating, right? But if we've scored something differently, then we have a whole process where we reach back out the NVD and we submit our proposal, right? And, and our, just, our reasons why, um, not based on just on the Red Hat specific you know, portfolio, but just from a flaw perspective standpoint, we try to do those rescores to help those, the NVD scores become a little bit more accurate as well. 
Um, but you know, rating wise, that uh, that that severity uh, 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 score, yeah, sometimes they're going to be a little bit low. And so we we uh, have statement text in our CVE pages where we try to to um, clarify that and why. I just looked at one the other day. It was like, oh well, you know, this is why, right? We don't include that bit of code, um, and we felt like that's useful and helpful. Did that answer your question, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course, all this stuff is pretty publicly accessible. Um, even sometimes Bugzilla cases, right? You could log in and see see what the developers are talking about or how it's being affected. So yeah, I usually find those pretty helpful in understanding, you know, the root cause <clears throat> or why why Red Hat determined, you know, this category or this score. Mm -hmm. Awesome. How about we jump to uh, containers a little bit, Jeremy. So your perspective, if you can give us some insight on what we do with containers, um, the container health index, how we grade those, how, how does that all work? Okay, so there's, you ask, you ask these, these questions that are kind of, you know, big, big overarching questions. Yep. So I think the first thing to say with containers is uh, um, it, it was a different shift in the, in the, the, the industry, right? You, you're used to like a kind of a box product uh, uh, and, you know, containers represent this bit of like static code that you pull out from, you know, somewhere else, right? And you bundle it up and create an image um, and how you handle security for that becomes a little bit different. Um, and we've written several blogs. I know my uh, manager here at Red Hat has written several uh, blogs out there for, for um, the Red Hat blogging, blog space to, to kind of explain this a little bit. But we took a different approach with um, our container registry and, and how we uh, were scoring. Right? So we, instead of looking at it from a, a vulnerability standpoint, we look at it from a time standpoint. Um, because uh, con containers consume that content from something else. That, that those where where the source of, on where it pulls that content, that's where that vulnerability technically lives, right? And it's patched there. So, for instance, if we if we take a look at our universal base image, right? So our UBI image, it pulls heavily from RHEL, right? Um, the the vulnerability is patched in RHEL. The the RHEL content then is then pulled into uh, a spin, right? A rebuild of that UBI image. Um, so what we're trying to display with our container health index is we're trying to tell uh, customers um, how, what, what's the risk from a standpoint of are there unpatched vulnerabilities, right? So if there's a vulnerability that we know is fixed in rail, but it wasn't applied to that container yet, then that's the concern. And specifically, how long has it gone, right? Because again, it's, it's and I think, I think my manager in his blog used this quote, I really like this, like, um, you know, it, it ages like milk and not wine, right? Wine ages really well, milk, curdles, sours, right? So the idea with containers is the longer they sit out there, the more sour they become, the more vulnerable they become. And so we're trying to, to represent that in the container health index. So for example, a container, I'm sorry, a grade A, there is no known um, critical or important vulnerabilities that have been um, unpatched uh, in that container. Something that's grade B, you're looking at like a 30, seven to 30 day time span. And we've got these published, right? So I won't, I won't repeat all of them, right? But we've got grade B, C, D, E. And the whole idea is if you can look in a container that's like a grade E or a grade D, there's a significant amount of risk there. That container has a lot of unpatched vulnerabilities that are known, right? There's actually a known fix for them. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. Um, and something I learned a while ago as well is that the container health index is not, you have a container that has these known vulnerabilities, but you have a container that has these known vulnerabilities with known fixes and aren't applied yet, correct? That's correct. Yeah, and so as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, we've got our great partners in scanning and, and they see reports they try to compare that to the container health index. And it's kind of an apples to oranges report um, because, you know, because the container health index is not showing all the vulnerabilities, all the CVEs that might be still yet to be patched that affect that container. Um, good point. I, get, I guess, Steve, do you see a lot of containers, scanning containers, um, dealing with security around containers? Oh. Absolutely. You know, this topic today is very important because this is the primary issue 
Um, you know, before we've had, you have that, that situation with containers, right? They're sort of the new almost VM images in a way, not really because they're limited, but it's the same concept where you get something that works, you know, as the developer, we've all been there. You have this base image you really like, you're going to, you know, it's got everything you need. It has Redis or what have you on it. And you, you, that to run your application in it and you're just you get very attached to that image because you know it works you know the version that it's at all the underlying pieces are together and it's using all these different libraries that you know are sort of working together and uh that's static it's a terrible thing that we're like that because it it causes us to reuse the base image over and over and over and over again and anytime you're doing we do work with clients who are doing container scan uh, tools, you know, like Claire that are, that are checking, um, um, how, you know, what vulnerabilities lurk in some of these, um, uh, containers. And it's, it's always those base images. It's always those old versions of libraries that if you were running a rel server and you were just keeping it up to date as you would, they would get fixed, but the container image, the base image, it's all sort of married together. It's all kind of dependent on each other. And so it's not something that you think about a lot in a developer context, something, of course, on the security side, we always point out and try to push, but sometimes there's a fair amount of detangling underneath, let's say in what you said of one of those D or E grade containers, you might be responsible for doing all that detangling if you want to keep using it and you fix one thing that's in the base image and then all of a sudden your, your Rita server doesn't work anymore and you have to figure that out. And that's what's great about having the scoring system because you're you're really scoring the the how well maintained it is because it's an ongoing containers are a moving target They're, they have to be they have to be kept up and and you're in your being able to grade is a great thing because then from the day one you can say I'm choosing this because they're going to keep up to date and avoiding that whole problem that's gonna that's gonna rear its head pretty quick. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good segue into our next topic. I guess before I go into there, I haven't been monitoring the chat feed, Chris. Has there been some questions or? Uh, no, not yet. Not, okay. Not, it, it, I'll let you know. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, I guess what I wanted to go to next is talk about container vulnerability scanning. Um, and so let me uh, let me share my slide again here. Let's see where is it? And I guess um, I don't know, Steve. How many of your customers look like that little girl? No. The, <laughs> <one of those? laughs> uh, well, in terms of in terms of when they start or the problems they're inheriting, um, especially when you start getting a scope of it. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> so by the way, this is a legal photo that I'm using. It's actually of my one of my daughters. <laughs> and her mom was actually pulling her hair out, which, by the way, is what our customers feel like when they um, scan containers and they see a huge list of vulnerabilities. And then they might compare that to Red Hat. And Red Hat says, no, 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 the container is good. And this is, this is actually, it's not tied to one scanner um, it's not tied to Red Hat. It's, it's sort of an industry issue just because of the challenges of being able to you know, identify the, the right components inside of a container, um, being accurate with that, understanding if it, something's backported or not, making that match um, to CVE, CVE and all the stuff that we've talked about, like even though CVSS says it's critical, is it really critical in your environment? So Red Hat, um, about six months ago, formally started an effort to help resolve this, help to provide um, what we call minimal discrepancies between our partner scan results and, um, and what you see at Red Hat. <clears throat> and I'm happy to say that we have, uh, you know, there is a happy ending, same, same daughter, but uh, much happier. And there's a happy ending that uh, we now have a certified uh, vulnerability scanner certification that we launched on February 23rd, um, which was about a six month effort with our partners to get set up. We took a, a good number of them through a pilot phase in order to understand what they needed and, and what we needed. Um, but 
there are a set of requirements and you can go out and find all this information online where our partners needed to meet in order to achieve certification. And you know, some of the requirements are that you have to pull from the right feeds, um, that you are showing Red Hat data in, in your UI. Um, and so we feel like this will really help to minimize you know, the amount of discrepancies when our partners are scanning Red Hat supported data. And you can see the, we announced the certified partners there in the 23rd Aqua New Vector Sysdig. And you can see the other partners right now that we're working with, Anchor, JFrog, Palo Alto, Sneak, and Synopsys that are working towards certification. We've got about 20 other partners that we know of that are out there. Um, but if you are a partner and you're interested, please feel free to contact us and we can help you through this certification. So we really think that, you know, this will lessen a lot of customer frustration um, in, in, the, in the market. And, um, and we're, yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Um, I guess, Steve, what do you think about that certification? Do you think that'll help your efforts? Help Absolutely. Your um, you know, what I, what I see with that is in terms of the, the you know, and we work with a lot of those technologies as well from the other side. So imagine that we're taking in data and our clients are taking in data from Sneak and taking in data from Prisma, Aqua, you know, these technologies. And um, what causes a lot of the work in terms in the field is when those scanners will maybe look at a container registry without the maybe because they're just not armed with the context I think you're providing in some cases to have um, maybe we'll spot something that is a, maybe a problem, but it's not as much of a problem because of the specific Red Hat release train. So for some of the, you know, the context that uh, Jeremy was providing earlier, sometimes these vulnerabilities are patched in a way where you're keeping the same version, for example, of the vulner of the system or of the package um, that is listed as vulnerable in NVD, but because of certain considerations in the way the configuration, you know, configuration's done, um, doesn't have the same attack profile. It's not the same thing, right? It's been either it's been either patched by Red Hat or it's been changed in some way. Everything with vulnerability management is about getting rid of those false positives and focusing in on the things that are actually the most important from a risk perspective. So the more context that those that those scanners can have going in, the better they're going to build that contrast and the the easier it's going to be for the for the consumer, for the client. Um, working with those result sets and in turn for us helping them to remediate those vulnerabilities. Yeah. Dave, can I, can I say one thing on that? Like, and uh, I suspect Steve will completely agree, I hope. Um, containers are, are complicated uh, from the standpoint of understanding the software bill of manifest, right? The, the um, what's in it. Uh, I, I think part of the challenge for our scanning vendors over the years has been to identify what's vulnerable and what's not. And, and we, you know, back in, if you look back at the, the, the early days of rail, um, it was really much easier to kind of scan that and look at a name version release string, right? On a package and say, okay, well, it's newer, or it's older, right? Simple math. With a, with a container these days, especially in, in the, the context of, you know, Red Hat, tries to provide maintenance for, for product versions for as, you know, as long as we can for, for a customer, right? Which means that we end up backporting a lot of patches back to a, a particular mainline branch of code, right? We have a lot of different branches out there that we maintain. And when you're a, uh, when you're a scanning vendor, how are you supposed to properly identify whether that particular branch had the patch or whether it didn't have the branch. You can't just simply rely on that name version release string anymore, right? So part of what we did with this uh, the scanning certification, um, it was like empowering the scanning vendors with more of that context to say, okay, we've done a lot of the heavy work for you. We're gonna, we're gonna help you figure out how to identify what's actually in, in that container and then we're going to uh, give you that context in the, in the form of like OVAL files, right? So that OVAL file has tests, it has uh, information on the RHSAs that fix it, what the status is for you know, each, each CVE. You're not using that context properly, right? So um, I don't feel like we're you know, putting all of the vendors on the same playing field, so to speak. I feel like we're, we're giving them all the same information um, and then letting them run with it. No, I, yeah. I, 
Yeah, hundred percent agree, and especially about the complexity because you have those, you know, you you containers as being just a, a singular thing. You have to realize, you know, when you're building one, there's a big interplay between the base images, what you're starting with, and then then adding things onto it. It's like yeah. a lot of different building block. To your point, if it's not aligned with the RSA, RHSAs, and that's what a lot of the certification is about, obviously, it, it's it's like you say, it's just not going to have the right context. And and you'll spend a lot of time, we'll spend a lot of time working with our clients, but our clients, we see them spending a lot of time chasing things to ground only to find, let's say, after three, four hours of research, oh, this version, like you said, I might have lost Steve there a bit. I want our clients having to spend that much time, you know, chasing those kinds of things. So absolutely right. Sorry, Steve, you, you kind of froze up there for a- Oh, really? I'm sorry. I was, just agree- I was just in a long-winded way agreeing with, uh, with yeah. Jeremy around um, the, preventing our clients from having to run around and look to prove out that this, this version of something was backported and fixed. I think that uh, uh, this, this really helps to save us time on that. Yeah, and I, I like one of the things you said there is that you have your base image, but then you've got stuff- that our customers add into it, their own applications, right? Which by the way, this certification doesn't cover because Red Hat doesn't care typically or know about the packages you use in those applications. That's why we value these scanning partners right? because they have the intelligence and that's their value to help you understand risk vulnerabilities in your applications outside of Red Hat scope, right? Um, the certification, though, will definitely help to minimize a lot of frustrations just on the base image. I mean, you could have hundreds of CDEs in a base image, and wouldn't it be great not to have to go through all the ones to, that are critical and high um, to ensure that you know they're <laughs> you're not vulnerable? So, well, cool. And so, Jeremy, you mentioned Oval um, Red Hat. I don't I don't know if we can still say recently, but um, we moved to a, a second version of our Oval feed. This was a couple of years ago, right? Would Would you mind talking about some of the enhancements? Sure. Yeah, I, I think really enhancements is a better way of describing it, right? It's the standard itself doesn't didn't really change. It's not like there was a version one or version two of the Oval standard. Um, we we um, um, made improvements in terms of how we classify, how we structure the Oval feed. Um, I think originally we were just kind of dumping it all into like single single files and, and uh, that didn't really work for from a portfolio like organization standpoint. So we actually break up our oval files now based off of um, uh, the, the, the base images, so to speak. So rel eight, rel seven. Um, and like if you went into our oval feed right now, our V2 oval feed and went into the rel eight folder, uh, you'd see all the products that are, that are built, you know, consume content from RHEL 8, like OpenShift, right? Um, we have several files there uh, in that in that Oval directory. We, we have um, an Oval file for um, that that includes unfixed uh, CVEs. Uh, we have an Oval file that that includes uh, EUS content and some of the old uh, some of the streams that we maintain for long periods of time. Um, and the trick really with these OVAL files is to figure out which ones, like I, like I mentioned previously, which ones to use, right? Depending on what you're scanning. Uh, if you're scanning an um, uh, OpenShift, you, know, you have to use a, a, a RHEL file plus an OpenShift file, right? Because there's a lot of content from RHEL that's also consumed. Um, and that, you know, otherwise you're, you'll end up with not necessarily false positives, but false negatives. Um, so you wanna make sure you're, you're looking at the right, um, the right files. Any specific questions beyond that, Dave? No, I think that I think that's good. And yeah, um, that was the basis of our certification. The main the the main requirement is to consume that um, those files, and then we actually, uh, you know, used Claire and the Claire team was very helpful in um, helping us formulate sort of the details on recommendations. We didn't we're not the experts, the scanner experts, as our partners are, but. Um, we use the, the Claire code as a reference to say, hey, how can you parse OVAL, you know, to show Red Hat data, to show the appropriate Red Hat data we were requesting. So, of course, Claire is open source and you can find all that information, you know, on GitHub. Um, so, no, that was good. Um, 
I guess anything else in the certification? I showed um, a couple of slides about the problem and, uh, and some of the partners. Um, anything else, Jeremy or Steve, you wanna chat about that? If not, I've got a couple other items to talk about. Um, I'll just, I'll also mention as well, like uh, it's important for us to make sure that we continually evolve, All right? So we're, we've, we consider all of these scanning vendors partners with us and, yeah. and we meet regularly with them to talk through uh, challenges that are still ongoing in terms of how to better identify the content, right? Or um, if there are new, you know, standards, so to speak, that we should be taking a look at. So, you know, we continue to meet with all these vendors on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. And, I, and I'm in a partner team here at Red Hat, so I talk to them on a weekly basis. But yeah, you have that uh, working group, which is really great as well. Well, cool. Yeah, so I mentioned, you know, this month is vulnerability analysis. Um, there'll be another OpenShift TV session in a couple of weeks. Um, and then we'll be dropping three podcasts as well. Now, uh, I wanted to share sort of the um, a byproduct of our efforts around DevSecOps. Let me share this screen, present it. Um, so I mentioned the categorization. We came up with uh, nine categories. You can see those categories here on the left-hand side. And uh, we have 10 months, as I mentioned, vulnerability sort of bubbles into application analysis. Underneath uh, those categories, you can see all the different items there. There's 34 different security methods. Um, and so we were able to take those methods and work with the industry, work with our partners to plot those against a DevOps pipeline, like you see here, Lifecycle, and um, which serves as a basis to understand and to start communicating and help our customers consume this information a little bit better you know, for example, if, if you're starting DevSecOps or if you have it, we can come in with a solution, joint solution with Red Hat or one of our partners and say, hey, have you thought about Secrets Vault across the entire lifecycle? Or what about GitOps and config management? Um, or are you checking your network policies during build automation? So what we've been able to do in certain situations is work with our partners to map where they excel at and enhance and extend Red Hat capability. And of course, where Red Hat um, has capability as well. And Red Hat, as you would imagine, has capabilities all throughout the life cycle here, very strong in the platform security side of the house. So things like a secure host, RHEL, and, um, and, and Cryo, the container platform, um, isolation and cluster hardening with compliance, which will be one of our monthly topics as well. And then in December, we'll get into a lot of real a Red Hat type information around platform security. But I just wanted to you know, throw this up here to give everybody a, a basis of why we're talking about DevSecOps and, and sort of how we're bringing this to the market as well. Awesome. Yeah. I'll, I guess I'll just leave this up as an ending slide here. Um, this month, again, vulnerability, next month, compliance. So if you're interested, maybe you're in the federal space or um, you, know, you have to worry about CIS benchmarks or PCI, uh, we're gonna have some experts join us to talk through compliance as well. And then you know, we'll go through the year with these different, uh, different categories. Fantastic. This is a wonderful lineup of content you have lined up for us here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. We're very excited. Yeah. So when is the next show? A month from now, right? No, the next DevSecOps is the way show. Yes. Is, is yes. Usually the third Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Of the month. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to have another OpenShift TV show in two weeks. Um, yes. And that's going to be around vulnerability scanning as well. Correct. Awesome. Yep. And that's going to be with one of our partners. Fantastic. All right. Well, folks, let us know if you have any feedback about the show, what you think. Uh, you can always reach me, uh, cshort at redhat.com, and I can ferry the, uh, the information back down. Um, and if 
you want to follow or ping me on Twitter, just at Chris Short on Twitter. That's for anybody, you know, out there that has any questions and wants me to, you know, get some information for you. Always available for that purpose. So thank you everyone for watching. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you all.